Hey what's up, Richard Rosamond here and welcome back to another exciting tutorial. Today I'm thrilled to show you my brand new plugin, DOF Pro for Adobe After Effects. DOF Pro generates photorealistic depth of field effects as a post process. Initially released in 2005 for Adobe Photoshop, it's since become one of the most sophisticated depth of field generators in the world, used by some of the most respected production studios. DOF Pro for After Effects, also known as DOF Pro AE, has been in development for over a year, and it is an advanced port from DOF Pro for Photoshop, also known as DOF Pro PS. It features some absolutely killer features not currently available in any other depth of field generator. Additionally, this new After Effects port also boasts many new capabilities, including alpha channel support and 32-bit color depth support, also known as floating point. Alright, without any further delay, let's jump into it. The first thing you'll notice, much like DOF Pro PS, is that the interface has been split up into logical control groups. We'll go over each of these control groups in depth. DOF Pro features a display and gamma correction controller in the main section of the interface. The display allows you to view various aspects such as the currently specified depth layer, focus layer, iris, iris array, selected highlights, and processed highlights. You'll find yourself toggling between these views when working with your project, and we'll go into each one in more detail. The gamma correction parameter specifies whether or not to transform to linear space before making computations. Afterwards, it transforms back. This should almost always be enabled unless you know the image hasn't yet been transformed to linear space. All right, let's explore the depth group. This group focuses on parameters pertaining to the depth layer. A depth layer tells DOF Pro the distance of every object in the scene from the camera, thereby allowing it to correctly defocus an image. If DOF Pro isn't provided a depth layer, it will apply a fixed amount of defocus to the entire image. This is the slowest method of computation because with a depth layer, various amounts of defocus up to the currently specified amount are applied. To assign a depth layer, we simply select the layer using the depth layer drop down menu. This layer must be in your composition panel, although it doesn't need to be visible. When we assign a depth layer, you can see the remaining parameters become enabled. We can also toggle the display parameter to show the depth layer and it will do so, inclusive of any adjustments we've made to it. Next up, we can specify what channel DOF Pro should take its values from. These can include luminosity, where all the color channels are added together and averaged, the red, the green, the blue, and finally the alpha channel. This parameter is useful because it allows you to embed your depth layer in one of your render's unused color channels, thereby eliminating the need for a separate depth layer altogether. In our case, we have the depth as a separate layer, so we'll simply go ahead with the default luminosity selection. The OF Pro provides an invert parameter. This is because some 3D apps export depth layers with values ranging from white to black, while others do the opposite. Using the invert parameter, you can adjust it to your particular workflow. Note that you shouldn't use the invert parameter to invert the defocus or you'll get incorrect results. Instead, change the focus to do this. The focus parameter is one of the most important parameters in DOF Pro. It allows you to specify the area to be in focus. First, let's add some defocus to our project and explore how this works. A focus value of 1.0 means the foreground will be in focus whereas a value of 0.5, for instance, means the middle will be in focus. And a value of 0.0, .0 means the background will be in focus. If we toggle back to the display dropdown and select it to focus map, we can also see the currently specified area of focus. The set focus parameter allows you to interactively select the focus point by clicking on the image. This will automatically update the focus parameter. Next, we have the curve parameter. The curve affects the level of defocus between the closest and furthest objects in the scene. It could be thought of as depth layer gamma. A higher curve value increases the in-between defocus level, while a lower curve value decreases it. Black point and white point are especially crucial parameters when working with a depth layer. They allow you to control the brightest and darkest limits of the depth layer. Additionally, they are especially helpful when working in 32-bit color depth. For instance, let's switch to this awesome render by Zeke Faust. If we take a look at the depth layer by displaying it in the display dropdown, 
it appears to show very little data. That's because the brightest level of the depth layer is actually 3.0 in this image, but it's being clipped at 1.0. Using white point, we can set it to 3.0, thereby revealing the previously hidden data. That wraps up our depth section. As you can see, it provides a powerful set of tools for adjusting your depth layer in just about any manner you need to. Now let's go back to our chess project. Next, we have the aperture group. This is one of the most exciting groups that provides unparalleled control over the look and shape of your iris. When a camera takes a photo, the aperture quickly opens and closes. This aperture has a number of blades assigned to it, depending on the manufacturer. The shape of the aperture opening is what dictates the shape of the bokeh in defocused areas. DOF Pro can mimic virtually every single type of aperture shape in existence using these parameters. The aperture shape dropdown allows you to specify the shape. To get a better idea of how this works, let's display the iris from the display dropdown. The options we have available are circular, polygonal, notched, and custom. A circular aperture shape is the default, and it's also the fastest to compute, so let's start with that one. The first parameter is aspect ratio. DOF Pro allows you to specify an aspect ratio for the aperture, which is important for matching real-world footage. Using this parameter, we can also generate anamorphic bokeh. The aspect ratio values match real-world values, so if you find one that you like, you can simply enter the value, such as 1.77 for widescreen. Next, we have the aperture size. This explicitly controls the amount of defocus. If we go back to the render display, we can see the results of adjusting it. It should be handled with care as large values can really slow down the computation. It is important not to get carried away with applying too much depth of field as that can result in unrealistic results. A solid understanding of how camera optics work will help you learn how much defocus should be applicable for any given scene. Going back to our iris display, next up we have aperture blades. As you can see, these parameters, as well as several others, are disabled because they don't apply to a circular aperture. However, let's explore them by changing our aperture shape to polygonal. By adjusting this parameter, we can control the number of aperture blades. DOF Pro supports between 3 to 16 aperture blades, which is enough to simulate just about every possible aperture on the planet. Blade angle allows you to rotate the aperture blades. Values of 0 to 100 control the degree of rotation from 0 to 360 degrees. Blade curve adjusts the curvature of the blades. More often than not, there is always some degree of positive curvature in real-world bokeh. The OF Pro also permits negative aperture curves, since this too occurs in real-world apertures. Next, we have notch angle. As you can see, this parameter is disabled because it doesn't apply to polygonal apertures. However, let's explore it by changing our aperture shape to notched. Blade notching occurs when the aperture is open wide enough so that the ends of the blades come into view. The shape is dependent on the lens and how the manufacturer designed the blades. Notch angle dictates how pronounced the angle of the notch is. It can be positive and negative so as to match any type of real-world notching effect. Similarly, notch scale controls the degree of blade notching. It's important to note that all other enabled parameters also apply to polygonal and notched apertures, such as blade angle and blade curve, for instance. Let's go back to our circular aperture and continue to look at the remaining parameters. Next, we have spherical aberration. There's a lot to learn about what this feature does and why it occurs, but we won't discuss those details here. Instead, Suffice it to say that DOF Pro can simulate both overcorrected and undercorrected spherical aberration. The spherical aberration will adapt itself to whatever aperture shape is currently specified, such as polygonal or notched. If you want to learn more about spherical aberration, check out the DOF Pro product page. Spherical aberration plus minus is best explained using this point array project and an associated linear depth layer which we can see through the display dropdown. Let's introduce some depth of field to this image. As expected, the lower area remains in focus and the upper area becomes defocused. Next, let's set spherical aberration to 100. 
Now let's set our focus to the middle by setting a focus value of 0 0.5. As you can see, the defocused areas in front, we have undercorrected spherical aberration, but in the areas behind, we have overcorrected spherical aberration. This is because bokeh are influenced differently in front of the focal plane versus behind the focal plane. Since the wavelengths traverse the focal point and flip, the spherical aberration also inverses. There is more info about this in the DOF Pro product page. We can override this physically correct behavior by disabling this parameter, thereby assigning the currently specified spherical aberration to bokeh in front and behind the focal plane. Let's go back to our chess project and continue exploring the aperture parameters. Next we have spherical aberration scale. This controls the size of the spherical aberration when used in combination with spherical aberration. Spherical aberration offset controls the offset of the spherical aberration when used in combination with spherical aberration and spherical aberration scale. Using this parameter allows for bokeh with thicker or thinner outlines, among various other effects. Softness controls how diffuse the bokeh should be. Some real-world examples have very sharp and clearly defined bokeh outlines, while others have softer and more diffused. This parameter helps achieve similar results. To see the next three effects more clearly, let's first switch to the iris array display. This view is helpful for effects that affect the aperture shape according to its location. Optical vignetting, also known as cat's eye, is the result of when obliquely incident light is confronted with a smaller lens opening than light approaching the lens head on. Increasing this parameter forces aperture shapes to take on the shape of the oblique opening, which results in a bokeh shaped similar to that of a cat's eye. DOF Pro also supports negative optical vignetting which we'll see is important for catadioptric lenses. Optical vignette scale works in combination with optical vignetting. When a small aperture becomes affected by a lens barrel much larger than its size, certain characteristics take hold. These are described in more detail in the DOF Pro product page. Adjusting the optical vignette and optical vignette scale together allow for these unique real-world effects to be replicated. Astigmatism controls the amount of tangential and sagittal astigmatism. This is a result of a lens not focusing on the same point in tangential and sagittal orientations. The OF Pro simulates real-world astigmatism very accurately, but it is computationally taxing, so it should be used with care. Let's take a look at the OF Pro's powerful chromatic and achromatic aberration features. These aberrations are caused by the inability of a lens to focus all wavelengths on the same convergent point. The result of chromatic aberration is visible red, green, and blue color fringing, whereas the result of achromatic aberration is magenta and green. These aberrations can occur longitudinally, laterally, or both. Using chromatic aberration or achromatic aberration in DOF Pro switches to a more complex algorithm. It requires three times the number of computations one for each wavelength, resulting in lower renders. There's a ton of information about this effect on the DOF Pro product page, as well as why it happens and when it tends to occur. I encourage you to check it out. For a clearer example of how chromatic aberration works, I'm going to set the spherical aberration to 100, so that the inside of the bokeh is also affected. Longitudinal chromatic aberration presents itself as red, green, and blue color fringing within the aperture shape. Longitudinal achromatic aberration presents itself as magenta and green color fringing within the aperture shape. The OF Pro supports both positive and negative chromatic and achromatic longitudinal aberration. Lateral chromatic aberration presents itself as red, green, and blue color fringing within the aperture shapes laterally across the screen. Lateral achromatic aberration presents itself as magenta and green color fringing within the aperture shapes laterally across the screen. DOF Pro supports both positive and negative chromatic and achromatic lateral aberration. To understand our next parameter, chromatic aberration plus minus, we'll switch back to our point array project as it works similarly to spherical aberration plus minus. Let's introduce some longitudinal chromatic aberration to this image. 
as you can see in the defocused areas in front, we have positive chromatic aberration, but in the areas behind, we have negative chromatic aberration. Once again, this is because bokeh are influenced differently in front of the focal plane versus behind the focal plane. Since the wavelengths traverse the focal point and flip, the chromatic aberration also inverses. There is much more info about this in the DOF Pro product page. We can override this physically correct behavior by disabling this parameter, thereby assigning the currently specified chromatic aberration to both bokeh in front and behind the focal plane. This parameter will work for both chromatic and achromatic aberration. Finally, let's explore the catadioptric lens parameter with our chess project. Catadioptric lenses, also known as mirror lenses or reflex lenses, combine refraction and reflection in an optical system through the use of lenses, dioptrics, and curved mirrors, cadoptrics. There is more info about this in the DOF Pro product page. Enabling this parameter will simulate a real-world catadioptric lens, which is known for its donut-shaped appearance. Catadioptric lens scale controls the size of the mirror occlusion. Catadioptric lenses can be combined with negative optical vignetting to simulate photorealistic real-world effects. And of course, they fully accept all other features such as spherical aberration, spherical aberration scale, chromatic aberration, and more. We're almost done with the aperture group, but let's take a look at custom aperture shapes. This feature allows you to use real aperture shapes you can extract from a photo for extremely realistic depth of field effects. You can match 3D renders to footage shot with a particular camera by sampling one of its aperture shapes from footage. Additionally, you can develop your own creative shapes. To explore this, I'm going to switch back to the single iris display. To use a custom aperture shape, we'll first drop it into the composition window, much like we did with the depth layer. In my case, I'm using a real catadioptic lens aperture shape. We will disable its visibility because we don't need to see it. Next, I'll set the aperture shape to custom, and from the layer selector parameter below it, I'll specify the custom aperture shape layer. We can now see our custom aperture shape is being used. If we switch back to a render, we can see how it affects the depth of field. And if we switch back to our iris array display, we can see that DOF Pro also allows you to apply chromatic and achromatic aberration to a custom aperture shape, and it works both longitudinally and laterally. Now that we've covered the aperture group, let's move on to highlights. Crisp, bright highlights are critical in achieving a pleasant and convincing depth of field effect. As such, DOF Pro has provided an arsenal of powerful tools, allowing you to have full control over the integrity and quality of the highlights. DOF Pro Highlight Enhancement works by allowing you to specify an upper and lower intensity threshold for controlling a bokeh's saturation, enhancement, and tint. For this section, we're going to use this other chess project which you might fondly remember as being one of DOF Pro's original demo images. The lower and upper thresholds control the range of intensity that will be affected. To see this in action, let's switch over to display our selected highlights. Right now, you can see that the range selected is between pixel intensity values of 200 to 255, or that respective value depending on what color depth you're working in. If we adjust these, we can see the selection range varies. The softness controls the selection softness between the lower and upper ranges. A value of 0.0, .0 presents no softness, while a higher value softens the range selection more and more. A softer value will make the highlights in the falloff range dimmer. Once we have a range specified, we can take a look at our processed highlights by switching the display menu to that respective mode and adding some defocus. This mode is helpful for fine-tuning the process highlights independent of the final rendered image. We can saturate the highlights by increasing the saturation parameter. Likewise, we can desaturate them. To boost the intensity of the highlights, we simply increase the enhancement parameter. Be careful not to go too far as that can lead to overexposure. 
Finally, let's say your film has a color grade and you'd like to match that coloring with the highlights. This can be easily accomplished using the tint parameter. This parameter works in combination with enhancement, so a tint will only start to show as the enhancement is increased. When we've got our highlights looking good, we can take a look at our final render by setting our display back to render. Here we can make further adjustments if required. The OF Pro's highlight enhancement features are extremely powerful and when used correctly can result in extraordinarily vivid bokeh. There are some technical comparisons on the DOF Pro product page that show its impressive output against other plugins. DOF Pro features a killer feature called Aperture Textures. Given enough time, dirt and dust accumulate on the front and rear element of the camera. Although not immediately visible in photographs, this reveals itself in the bright bokeh. Any layer can now be used as an aperture texture. To use an aperture texture, we simply drop it into the composition window. I'm going to use this lens dirt texture. Since we don't need to see it, I'll turn off its visibility. Next, I'll go to the lens texture group and I'll assign it from the aperture texture dropdown. To see my aperture texture more clearly, I'll switch the display dropdown to iris. We can see the texture is already applied and it looks great. Typically, we want to use aperture textures that are predominantly white with black details. If yours is the opposite, you can simply invert it using the invert parameter. We can adjust the intensity of the aperture texture by playing with the intensity parameter. Additionally, we can adjust the texture scale by working with the scale parameter so that it aligns correctly within the aperture shape. Finally, the OF Pro also features radial offset for aperture textures. In real world examples, aperture texture placement offsets radially according to bokeh position. To see this effect more clearly, let's switch to iris array. Now let's increase the offset parameter. We can now see the aperture texture becomes increasingly offset the further it deviates from the center of the screen. We can also apply negative offset. Let's apply chromatic and achromatic longitudinal and lateral aberration. You can see the aperture textures fully respect these features. You can even combine aperture textures with custom aperture maps. Let's check out our render now. The OF Pro's lens texture capabilities are truly awesome and can help make your depth of field effects reach ultra photorealistic levels. Now that we finished exploring the aperture texture, Let's check out the matte box section. A matte box is a device mounted on the end of a lens to block outside light in order to prevent glare and lens flare. A matte box and a lens hood are essentially the same thing, but a matte box uses adjustable fins called French flags, and in some cases, these will crop the bokeh depending on the angle of the flag. The OF Pro's matte box features affect bokeh exactly the same way real matte boxes do. To see how this works, let's switch over to our iris array. The OF Pro provides parameters for top, bottom, left and right control. Each parameter will affect the bokeh accordingly and will fully respect all the other parameters, such as spherical aberration, spherical aberration scale, different aperture shapes, and more. At this point, we've reached our last group and coincidentally one of the most important ones, noise. DOF Pro includes an extremely powerful pixel noise rendering engine for producing even more realistic depth of field effects. Noise is an inherent, naturally occurring byproduct of most 3D ray traced engines and digital CCD cameras. The reintroduction of noise in defocused image areas is crucial in producing a realistic depth of field effect as that is almost entirely eliminated through the processing. The OF Pro's noise rendering engine can recover lost noise in the areas where it needs it. To explore this, let's switch over to this awesome 3D render by Bago Games. I've created a linear depth map to go along with it so that we can apply some convincing depth of field. If we zoom in, we can see that the original image has a good amount of noise in it already. Let's zoom back out to our full frame view. First, we'll increase the defocus to 15. We can see the left hand side of the image remains in focus, which is expected from our white to black gradient depth layer. 
Next, we'll also interactively set the focus to the center of the controller, where the controller button lies. We can see our depth of field effect works perfectly. However, if we zoom into the defocused areas, we can see that the noise has been entirely eliminated. This is unrealistic, especially if we pan over to the areas in focus that contain noise. We can reintroduce noise by increasing the noise amount. Let's try a level of 4. This is much better, but we can see the noise was distributed evenly and throughout, thereby compounding the noise amount in the focused areas. This isn't very realistic. We want to recover lost noise from only the defocused areas. We can do this by setting the map distribution to blur amount. Now we can see that only the defocused areas are receiving noise proportional to how much defocus those areas have received. We can also apply the noise according to the focus map, but stronger levels of noise will be required. The noise engine is by default set to animated, which means that every frame will generate new random noise. Disabling this will not reseed the random noise generator, and every frame will receive the same noise. Noise can be monochromatic or colored, depending on the original noise present. It can be distributed by luminosity evenly or photometrically, which will affect darker areas more than lighter ones. Finally, noise can be tinted to match any particular film color grading, in much the same way highlights can. And that wraps up our noise control group. If you're still with me at this point, congratulations, we've come to the conclusion of our overview. I hope you now have a better understanding of the capabilities and functionality of DOF Pro for After Effects and why it has become one of the world's most sophisticated depth of field processors. Head over to the DOF Pro product page and check out the plugin in more detail to see what it's capable of. Additionally, you can download the demo and try it out for free. Finally, we have a very exciting gallery in the product page filled with stunning CGI and photographic work from talented artists and studios worldwide. I encourage you to submit your high quality work created with DOF Pro, both with the Photoshop version and After Effects version, so that it can be featured in our gallery. Thanks for watching.